Well, welcome everybody to the introduction to comprehensive iridology. I appreciate all of you spending your time tonight to listen to me talk about iridology. It is my passion. Uh, it's going to be 35 years that I've been involved with iridology in August. I can't believe it's been 35 years. So uh, I've been uh, working with iridology for a long time. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here and uh, go through my little presentation for you. Okay, so uh, this is the introduction to comprehensive iridology. I'm Brenda Generali, and there's all my list of all the things that I'm involved in. I'm the president and CEO of Joyful Living. Uh, I am, uh, we are a sanctioned school through IPA. And uh, I am a certified comprehensive iridology instructor for levels one, two, and three. If everybody could mute, please. Change it. And they're going to be able to do it maybe later. Let me see here. Let me see if I can help. Okay. And uh, I am a certified uh, genomic iridologist, as well as a nutritional consultant, and I'm involved in all kinds of different groups. Um, there's my website, joyfullivingservices.com, and my email, uh, which now I don't want to ever get rid of. And people say that net zero is old, but it's iridology at net zero. So now I never want to get rid of it. And there's uh, telephones if you need to reach me, if you have questions and want to talk to me. So, um, like I said, I just want to thank you for being for being here tonight. That's an amazing picture that one of my students sent to me uh, with the hummingbird, and uh, I love that. I love that image. It's amazing. First thing, what I want to do is go over my disclaimer here. Uh, Joyful Living Services cannot be held liable for any misuse or malpractice of any techniques taught within this webinar nor for any injury, suffering, or distress caused by students undertaking the techniques discussed. All students must accept that they are wholly responsible for their actions relating to the practice of iridology and must adhere to the relevant laws in their country and state of residence. Students are responsible for ensuring that they have appropriate insurance for practicing in their country and state of residence. Joyful Living Services cannot be held responsible for any advice given by students to members of the public. Students must adhere to their local laws regarding the requirement for registration and or qualification as an iridologist before suggesting supplements or offering nutritional advice. So here's a little bit of information about myself. And uh, I started my path in iridology in 1983 uh, when I had uh, my first well, actually it was when I was 12 is when I had my first recollection of having health problems. But my path to iridology began with somebody that I was dating who had a friend whose girlfriend had endometriosis and she was seen an iridologist. And yeah, I was having all kinds of bowel issues. You know, I wasn't dating. So we all know how stressful dating can be. I was dating and uh, was having lots, lots of digestive issues lots of stress, breaking out in hives all over my body, um, panic attacks, and just, just you know, couldn't lay straight on my bed flat. I had to sleep in a curled up position. I'd been to a doctor and they, they said, oh, just, you know, drink milk and take Rolaids, which that made it even worse, and uh, had um, colitis and lots of different problems, but all, mostly all stress-related. And uh, my friend said, why don't you go see an iridologist? And I said, well, what's that? And she explained it to me. So I did. I made an appointment. Actually, her iridologist was booked. He couldn't see me. So I made an iridologist to see Chris Wickert. Saw him. And uh, he looked at my eyes, told me all kinds of things that were going on and uh, told me about some, you know, supplements to take. And I took them and got better. And um I had friends that had problems, so I sent my friends to him, and they got better. And this one day, uh, I just thought, gee, you know, I'd like to learn more about this. Uh, called up Chris and said, how do I learn more about iridology? And he said, Dr. Jensen teaches. Why don't you call his office? He's down in Escondido. 
So I called and uh, they had a beginning class that was coming up. So I signed up for it just to see, you know, if I'd like it. And I loved it, loved it. So I stayed for the advanced certification. And the next week I was getting referrals from Dr. Jensen's office. And that was 35 years ago. So that led me to develop Joyful Living Services. I took a class on a brainstorming class and a class on learning how to write your mission and setting goals and all that kind of stuff. And that's how I came up with Joyful Living Services and uh, decided that my mission is basically to help others to improve their health. So in 2018, I became a member of IPA and I am a comprehensive iridology instructor for levels one, two, and three now. They just came out with three, so that's that's a new level. And I see clients from all over the world. I do in-person consults. I see people remotely over Zoom. I see lots of people. And uh, I am creating a wellness center. I've been in this office for a year, and I'm going to be moving and starting August 1st. So I'm very excited about that and what that is going to show up like. My future goals include... Um, completing an iridology book called Iridology, the Path to Joyful Living. And I am in a iridology fellow program with IPA. So uh, this picture was taken of me years ago uh, by Dr. Pesek. If any of you are familiar with Dr. Pesek, he has an iridology con congress in October every year. And uh, he, I, I didn't even know, he's, at least I don't remember, obviously I was looking at him, but he snapped that picture and uh, that was in 1988 when I was at Dr. Jensen's birthday party. Um, and they had a room full of these iridology cameras and we took pictures of everybody's eyes that attended the, the uh, symposium. So there I am, I was, taking, I was taking pictures, I volunteered to do that. So that was, that was a neat experience. It's great that, that uh, somebody took a picture of me and sent it. So now I have, I have a memory of that. And uh, that, was, that was a great time. So this is my office now. It actually looks a little different. Uh, I have a cab, couple of cabinets here. This is in the beginning when I opened it. And, uh, but uh, this is my office here right now. And uh, this is my daughter, Josephine here. And this is the camera that I use. This is a SD-804 that I use with all my clients. And she's got her, I asked her to demo. So she put her head and her chin in the, in the chin rest here. And um, so I'm, I work a lot of hours. I'm teaching and I see clients and I work, I work out of this office. But the new office is going to be uh, large and it has several office spaces in it. And uh, there's a lot of potential. I can do classes. So I'm thinking about you know doing live classes and involving Zoom. Uh, so people can also come in remotely. So I think it's going to be great. Great. It's going to be a, a really good opportunity. So let's talk about iridology. Well, what is iridology? For those of you don't, that don't know, iridology is a study of the color and the structure of the iris of the eye as it relates to the genetic predisposition and health of the body systems. And in my advertisement, I did talk about, you know, where iridology has, you know, gone from Dr. Jensen to Ellen, and it's continuing on, on through IPA. So I'll talk about that a little bit. But iridology really has, in some ways has changed, and in other ways is not. And um, iridology is a science, just like any science, and science continues to evolve as we continue doing research. So all of us instructors in IPA, and there are many of us, but all of us instructors are doing research. And we're all doing our own research. You know, whatever, whatever we're interested in, we're doing research in. I, I pretty much am focusing on MTHFR. And that is a, that's a presentation that I just gave to IPA and I've, I've given it as a webinar before, but I'm relating the pigments in the eyes and how they relate to MTHFR gene errors. So whatever we're interested in, you know, somebody else may be doing a uh, research on breast health or somebody else may be doing research on thyroid or whatever, um, then that helps to bring iridology forwards and to see, you know, how iridology, that helps us to see how iridology is changing. And um, we're doing a lot of this research with IPA. So here we have, in, in North America, we have three styles of iridology. We have Jens Jensenian, so from Dr. Jensen. 
uh, RAID, which is an emotional iridology from Denny Johnson and Jim Burgess. And Jim Burgess, he works with behavioral iridology. So for those of you that are interested in physical iridology, that's going to be Jensen and that's going to be uh, constitutional, okay? Constitutional is a combination or comprehensive, it's a combination of Dr. Jensen that's gone to Ellen Jensen that has gone to NIRA, which has become IPA, okay? So before Dr. Jensen passed, he asked his daughter-in-law, Ellen, to continue his research, which she has done. And so that has become the NIRA, which was a national Iridology Research Association to IPA, which is the International Iridology Research Association, uh, Practitioners Association. And it includes Jensen Iridology and it also includes European. Okay, so if you're interested in learning your uh, emotional iridology, then that would be Rayad with Denny Johnson. If you're interested in behavioral iridology, that would be Jim Burgess. So constitutional iridology, that originated with Joseph Deck and other iridologists. It's used by doctors in Italy, Germany, Russia as a screening tool. There are correlative medical studies being done all the time. Okay, it teaches that the eyes are a reflection of genetic or inherent structure of the body. So that's where we're going with it. Okay, we look at the eyes as a, uh, as a genetic, for genetic tendencies, not as a diagnostic tool. Okay, it's not transitional. Okay, what that means is that it's accumulative. So in other words, what that means is that we normally don't see markings leave the eye. What we normally see is an accumulation. So the spots, the pigments, the lines, the rings, usually they'll become darker, more of them. Uh, the rings may become thicker, brighter, darker, and so on. Okay, uh, the eyes do not give us the answers. Okay, it tells us what questions to ask. So rather than diagnose somebody and say, hey, you know, you've got inflammation of the joints, you have arthritis, we're going to ask the questions. Do you have pain in your joints? You know, there's a lot of white in your eye. White has to do with usually pain, inflammation, agitation, irritation. Okay, do you have pain in your joints? So that's what's happening. We're, instead of telling somebody what they have or diagnosing somebody, which we cannot do, uh, we will ask the questions, okay? And uh, other iris and sclera changes can continue to become visible with time, revealing areas that may need support. So we're looking for areas that may need nurturing, okay? May need nurturing. And we always like to get background information because, and that's really important so that we're not doing cold readings. Cold readings are when we just, you know, like what I do, I go to the health food store and I'll sit with somebody for a half an hour and give them some information about their eyes, but I have no background information on them at all. Uh, and that's called a cold reading. So, you know, we don't like to do a lot of those because we don't have the background information. It's better if we have all the information on a client so that, you know, we've got all their information. We can look at their eyes. We can look at their sclera and, and really give them a nice, you know, uh, some good information. So how is iridology used? Well, basically by looking at the iris of the eye, we can see genetic tendencies. And by learning about someone's genetic tendencies, we can suggest, you know, things that they should drink, things that they should eat, what type of exercise they could do, uh, supplements, lifestyle, anything else that'll help them live comfortably in their body. And iridology does not name a disease, but it shows us what areas need nurturing or what body systems need strengthening, okay? So in the United States, we cannot diagnose, or we cannot diagnose, and why would we want to anyway? We're not doctors. That's what doctors do. Now, there may be different rules in other countries, but uh, here in the United States, we're not allowed to diagnose. So we can analyze, okay, and we can make suggestions. So we can talk about genetic tendencies, we can talk about uh, areas that need to be nurtured or may need to be nurtured and make suggestions about how these areas uh, can be nurtured. Okay, so what can iridology show us? It can show us inherent strengths and deficiencies of organs, glands, and tissues. And we see that by looking at the structure of the eye. That is one way that iridology has changed a lot. Um, when we look at the iris, when we look at the iris, what we see, what changes is the pupil. The pupil changes. So if you think about, if you think about light, 
Okay, when you go outside in the sun or you turn the light on in a room or you have a bright light shine in your eye, that is going to constrict the pupil. The, the pupil constricts, or at least it's supposed to. Okay, so it's supposed to constrict. And when that pupil constricts, it pulls all the markings in, all the markings in the iris, all those fibers in the iris get long. All those lacuna, if you're familiar with iridology, all those lacuna became, become elongated, they get long, okay? Uh, now the opposite happens if you go into a dark room, right? If you go into a dark room, then your pupil expands, it enlarges. And now what's that going to do? That's gonna push everything out to the perimeter. So everything, all of those lacuna that were long are going to become wide. In the past, what we used to think is we used to think that had to do with the iris changing, the structure of the iris changing. What we've learned through research is the structure doesn't change, really doesn't change. The structure is the structure, that's who you are. Okay, that is your, that's your, those are your genetic tendencies. What's changing is the pupil. The pupil contracts, everything gets pulled in and gets long. The, the pupil enlarges and everything's pushed out towards the edges and, and enlarges. And you know that makes a lot of sense. So normally what happens is we can accumulate pigments, we can accumulate more markings, and I'll show you a couple, a couple of those uh, pictures. And, um, um, but they don't really go away. I mean, once in a while, we'll see them go away. And, you know, we look at the pictures to see uh, lighting has a huge, it, it has a huge impact on how the, the eyes look, how the eyes look and uh, your emotions. Now your emotions that can show change, that can show change. So if you're upset or angry or excited about something, uh, the whites will become whiter. You know, your pupils will change, change uh, uh, size and, you know, everything will get whiter. And if you're sad and depressed and, and down in the dumps, then everything gets darker. So, you know, that can change. Also the amount of water that you drink throughout the day, uh, you know, that has to do with the aqueous fluid in, in the eyeball. And that changes throughout the day. So the more water or less water that changes and that can change the way the eye looks. Same thing with what I'm wearing. I'm wearing black today, tonight. So if I was wearing a bright blue or an orange or red, that's going to make my eyes look different. You know, a blue-eyed per person, uh, if they wear green, uh, a green blouse or a green shirt or a blue shirt, uh, it's going to make their eyes look different. So uh, the seasons, depending on when you're taking pictures, if you're taking pictures in the spring or the fall or the winter or the summer, that can make a difference. If you're taking pictures inside, outside, if you have new batteries in your camera, old batteries, there's so many things that make the eyes look different. But when we really study the eyes, the structure doesn't change. And we're finding that a lot of the beliefs about the color and what shows up in the eyes, a lot of it has to do with the amount of light that's shined in the eye. Okay, so iridology can also show us the potential ability of an organ to react to illness. And we see that based on the structure, the, 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 the fiber structure, how tight the fibers are um, and, and so on, and what's showing up in those various reaction fields. Uh, we can see familiar patterns of various syndromes and pathologies. And what's really fun to do actually is to have several generations. So grandma, mom, and daughter, or, you know, grandpa, uh, son, and grandson, or, you know, the whole family have them together and see the, the different patterns in the eyes. And you'll also see some of the same things, or you'll see some of the things passed down. And they'll just show up in different areas or maybe smaller, larger, you know, different, uh, but you will see familiar patterns. Certain foods that a person could have difficulty digesting or utilizing, and that's based on iris color. Okay, and it can show areas of the spine that may have subluxation. And we see that by the pupil, the shape of the pupil. Okay, so in iridology, we also study the pupil. So we don't only study the iris, but we also study the pupil. We also study the sclera and the sclera is the white part of your eye. So we learn how to also, at least in the IPA class, we learn how to read the little vessels that are in the sclera, the different shapes of those, where they are and what they mean potential central and autonomic nervous system imbalance, potential circulatory disturbances, potential connective tissue weaknesses, 
uh, potential for glandular deficiencies, potential for high uric acid levels, serum cholesterol levels, and lymphatic congestion. And notice these all say potential. Okay, that's because we cannot diagnose. We can't tell somebody by looking at their eye, oh, you have high cholesterol. We can't do that. Because just because the marking shows up in the eye that we may think somebody has high cholesterol, we won't know unless we send them for a blood test. They may not. They may not have high cholesterol. This may be genetic from mom, dad, grandma, grandpa. You know, it may be genetic. And, they, and the person that we're looking at that has the marking in their eye may not have any problem at all. Okay, but they may have the genetic tendency for it. So they may need to work on it, even though they don't have a problem right now, they might need to work on it. Or maybe because their diet is so good, they're not having a problem. But if their diet, if they start eating all kinds of hamburgers and going to eat fast food at midnight and so on, then maybe they would start having problems. Okay. So what can, not, what can iridology not show? Lots of things. It cannot diagnose or give the name of any disease a person may have or have had or identify pathology. Okay, that's for doctors to do. That's not for us. Okay, it cannot determine if a person has had surgery. When you go under anesthetic, an anesthesia, the, the nerve impulses stop. So we can't see if somebody has surgery. We can see what it looked like before the surgery because it's not going to change. That marking will always be there. So if somebody, let's say somebody had their gallbladder out, uh, you know, we can look in the gallbladder reaction field to see if there's anything there, if there's a crypt or a, a pigment or a lacuna or something that's showing up in that area. And we could say, oh, well, okay, it looks like you did have, you know, you probably did have an issue there, okay? But we can't see if a person's had surgery. Indicate precise blood pressure levels, that's for a cuff. Determine if a person has parasites or indicate the presence of yeast. That's something else that's changed. We used to think that radial, uh, radii solaris told us that somebody had parasites uh, and um, white in the eye would say somebody had yeast. And these are things that we have learned. There are markings that show up in the eyes um, for parasites and also in the sclera. And there are markings that show up for yeast, but they're different than what we originally thought. Okay, so that is a big change. Confirm the presence of viruses, germ life, or bacterial invasion. No, but we can see some markings in the sclera that can indicate that maybe a person's having a problem with a virus or that can indicate that a person may have a bacterial infection and then they need to get that checked. Okay, or we need to do further testing, maybe with the Zyto, maybe with muscle testing or any other kind, you know, live blood cell or any other kind of uh, testing that we can do. Determine if a woman is pregnant or has had an abortion. No, we cannot do that. <clears throat> Indicate whether a tumor is present or what size it may be. No, but there is an encapsulation sign that can show up in the sclera. So if we see that, that can indicate maybe something's developing, uh, maybe there's a, a source of infection, maybe there is a area that the body has encased, something that um, maybe parasites or, you know, something that the body is holding on to. But there again, we can't prove that by just looking at the sclera. Okay. We can't say, oh, you have a tumor. We can say there's a possibility or maybe you should get that checked. Okay. Maybe there's a problem there. And as far as determining if a woman is pregnant or has had an abortion, you know, I learned a long time ago that there were some iridologists that were saying you could tell the sex of the baby that a, a, a woman is carrying based on the lines that are in the bottom of the iris. So if she had a line on one side, it was a boy. And if she had a line on the other side, it was a girl. And I tried it to see if it was, it was true and it, it wasn't. Sometimes it was true, sometimes it wasn't. So when you have something like that, where sometimes it's true and sometimes it's not, it gives iridology a bad name. And so, you know, we can't, unless, unless it's true, we can prove it over and over and over again, then we can't, we can't even use that. Uh, iridology cannot show whether or not a person has kidney stones or gallstones. No, we can't show that. 
give exact cholesterol or uric acid levels in the body. No, that's for doctors. Determine whether or not hemorrhage exists or where it's located, unless it's located in the visible, visible layers of the eye. So if somebody has a broken capillary and their sclera gets red, you know, we can see that, but we can't see the other. Show if arteries are blocked or hardened, through a though a potential for this can be seen in the sclera. So the sclera and sclerology is wonderful for complementing iridology. And so we use both. We use both iridology and sclerology together. Okay, and that's, that's great because that gives us even a better picture. Distinguish the gender or age of a person, predict a person's lifespan or impending time of death. No, you can't do any of that. Okay, tell whether or not a person needs surgery. Ah, uh -uh, that's for a doctor to say. That's not for us. That's not for us. Unless there's a doctor that's working with iridology, then that's different. But that is not for us to say. Iridology cannot locate a specific tooth that may be problematic. However, Zyto can. The Zyto scanner can. When I run the scans, that can uh, tell us where there could be teeth that or gum areas that may be problematic. Show if a person has ingested poison or been bitten by a poisonous spider or snake. Nope. Okay, so those are some things. And now um, I'm gonna go over some pictures. This is the fun part of iridology is looking at eye pictures. So with Dr. Jensen, when I got certified all those years ago, uh, we believed that there were only blue and brown eye colors. And everything in, in between that was toxins. Okay, so uh, here, this is a blue eye, right? This is my son here. This is my son's eye. And he's got a blue eye. And uh, here's a brown eye. This is a true brown eye here, okay? And uh, anything in between, which would be here, would be somebody that was toxic and needed to cleanse and do cleanses. This is actually my eye. And when I was down at Dr. Jensen, he looked at my eyes. He told me I had blue eyes and I needed to do cleansing. Okay, so I did. I did all kinds of cleanses, tons and tons of cleanses, bowel cleanses, colonics, colemas, gallbladder flushes, liver flushes, um, whole, you know, um, fasts, um, whole food diets, um, all kinds of things. Okay, and guess what? It's 35 years later, and this is my eye. Hasn't changed. No matter how many detoxes, how much acidophilus I've taken, how many flushes I've done nothing. My eyes are the same as they were. I have, I have multiple pictures throughout the years. And, you know, these rings at times look brighter. Sometimes they look darker. Sometimes this looks lighter or darker, but my eye is mixed. I have mixed eye. I have my, my grandma on my mom's side had blue eyes. Um, my, both of my parents have the same color eye I, I have. My great grandma had blue eyes. My great grandma and my grandma on my mom's side had blue eyes. Uh, my daughter has the same color eyes I have. My, and here's my son. So my husband has blue eyes like this. And uh, so it's very interesting. So there is a mix of blue and brown. So if you look here underneath, you can see this kind of looks green down here. And here in the center, it looks more orange. Um, and I do have brown pigments in there as well. Okay, so this is a this is a classic mixed eye here. So each eye color has its own genetic tendencies, its own set of foods, its own set of exercises, its own set of diets, its own set of herbs that could benefit that eye color, okay, that eye type. So with a blue eye, we call it a lymphatic eye. And a blue-eyed person, blue-eyed people tend to have more respiratory lymphatic tendencies, okay? Uh, a mixed biliary eye, bi biliary stands for bile. Bile has to do with liver and gallbladder, okay? So most mixed-eyed people tend to have more issues with digestion, stomach, liver, gallbladder, colon, pancreas, okay? These are all uh, small intestines, okay? Everything having to do with digestion. If you listen to them talk, and they, you know, you ask them where they have problems. You know, these blue-eyed people tend to be mucousy, coughing up mucus, always mucousy, having problems with sinuses and bronchioles and lungs and pneumonia and things like that, and arthritis and things like that. People that are, are mixed-eyed people, they're usually going to say they have problems with indigestion or their colon, their bowels, uh, blood sugar, things like that. 
And brown-eyed people, it's mostly blood and bone. A lot of, um, of brown-eyed people have trouble with anemia, with iron and uh, minerals. They burn their minerals. That doesn't mean that all blue-eyed people always have the same genetic tendencies, okay? Or they have all those genetic tendencies and all mixed-eyed people all have the same and all brown have the same. But in, in researching the different eye colors, uh, these are some of the things that we've learned. Okay, so here is uh, my son's eye. And uh, when we look at the eye, when we look at the eye, we're looking at all of these lines, spots, holes, anything looks like a hole here. Uh, inside here, it's just, it works just like your body does. So inside here, so you, this is your pupil. This here is just like the center of your body. Okay, this is the stomach and the intestines here. Okay, stomach and intestines and colon. That's in the center. Okay, at the top of your body is your brain, right? Your head. Okay, and so here from 11 to 1, this is the brain area. Down at the bottom of your body, right? Hips, legs, thighs, knees, feet, ankles, uh, lower organs, kidneys, adrenals, right? Okay, and so here down at the bottom here, we have the leg and uh, the feet, okay? The hips, the adrenals, kidneys, okay? On the outside of your body is your skin. This is the skin out here. And inside that is the lymph and the circulation. And everything else is in between. So this happens to be a right eye. So out here would be the lungs and the bronchioles. Okay, the spine would be in here. And wherever we see any kind, anything that looks like a little hole or anything that looks like a bright line or uh, this color right here, very white. White has to do with inflammation usually inflammation and pain, overactivity, all those kinds of things, inflammation. And uh, so we get to talk to our clients about that. And instead of saying, oh, I think you have arthritis, we ask, do you have pain? Or do you have a problem here? Or do you have a problem there? I mean, we can see that, that they probably do, but we can't say it because we're not doctors. We can't diagnose and we can't prescribe. We can ask the questions, we can analyze, and we can make suggestions at least here in the United States. Okay, so that's a lymphatic iris constitution. And if you're in my Facebook group, I'm always behind in my Facebook group, Facebook group, but if you're in my iridology Facebook group, you'll see that I go in there once in a while and I make comments for people. People send in their pictures and then I make comments. Usually I'm gonna comment on the color, if they're lymphatic, mixed biliary or hematogenic for brown. Okay, and I'll usually and I have all that information in there. And then I'll usually comment on something that stands out. Maybe they have pigments or maybe they're, you know, this is this here, this is called a funnel. They may have a funnel or they could have, these are little lacuna here. I might talk about a lacuna or I might talk about the shape of the pupil, if it's round or flat or, you know, elliptical or whatever, or maybe there's the skin out here is really dark. I might say something about that. If you're not a member of the Facebook group and you want to be, uh, you could just look for iridology in Facebook. And then um, I have like, I don't know, 8,000 people in there now, eight or 9,000 people. You can join. It's a private group. And uh, I do make comments in there. And there are rules that you have to follow. So you have to agree to the rules to uh, become a member. So this is my eye. And what I said in the beginning is that I had a lot of stress. <clears throat> and I was breaking out on my skin all over with hives. I was hardly able to eat anything. I was almost eating baby food all the time. And just, just lots of bowel problems. Well, if you look at these rings, you see these rings, it kind of looks like you know, when you walk in the forest, when you walk in the forest and you see a tree that's been cut down, you can count those rings. You can count those rings in the, in the tree to see how old the tree is. In iridology, we see these rings as stress rings, sensitivity rings, anxiety rings, okay? This is one way that people can show stress, sensitivity, anxiety in their body. <clears throat> and what I've always had these rings. They've not never gone away. Somebody said, oh, if you take a lot of B complex, they'll go away. I've taken lots of B. They've never gone away. I've done lots of baths. 
I love floating. Lo floating is amazing. Meditation, walks, uh, I mean, all kinds of relaxation techniques. Uh, acupuncture, massage, um, chiropractic, you name it. I've done it. And guess what? These rings are the same as they were 35 years ago because that's who I am. This is who I am. If I, if I get sh too stressed out and I don't take care of myself, guess what happens? I get pain all over my body. I get pain in my muscles. Okay. I get pain in my muscles. I start having massive digestive problems. My bowels act up. I haven't broken out in my skin it, it, with hives since the beginning. So that's never happened again. Um, but these rings uh, go right through. This is, this is called the ciliary zone here. And these rings go right through the muscles, the muscles and the tissues and the tendons of the body and all the organs. And so if I get really stressed and I'm not taking care of myself, I'll hurt. Okay, I'll hurt. And so I've got to get back on my program. And I'm really careful. I, I, I'm pretty good about getting massages either every week or every couple of weeks. And uh, I see, you know, I get a chiro I get my adjustments regularly. I float. I take my my supplements that that I know that work and, and I'm good. I'm good. The other thing that these rings have to do with is accomplishment. So maybe you have these rings in your eyes. OK, not only does it have to do with stress and anxiety and, and sensitivity, like if you're very sensitive, emotionally sensitive, but it also has to do with accomplishment. So, you know, these rings can show up in people that are a type personality. In other words, they have a strong drive they accomplish a lot okay a type a type personality kind of like to have things a certain way right they like things a certain way and uh they they accomplish a lot of things and i am definitely a type personality so that allows me to do all the things that i do that allows me to teach and allows me to see clients and have an office and and i i love it okay but i have to watch it i've got to i've got to be careful with my body because if i do too much then i pay for it okay but I do accomplish a lot. I do accomplish a lot. And Dr. Jensen, all those years ago, when I got certified, somebody asked him because he does have, he did have two rings in his eyes. And I have, I have his pictures up on the wall. Um, and somebody asked him, you know, if you're doing all these things and you're taking care of your body and you're taking all these supplements and you're, you're eating an 80, 20 diet and doing all these things, why do you have these rings in your eyes? And I remember him saying that, if, you know, you've got to have a little bit or you won't get anything done. And, you know, we all laughed at the time, right? We laughed. We thought that was funny. And I always thought that was his kind of way of just saying, you know, oh, well, you got to have a little bit of stress, right? Or, you you know, everybody has a little bit of stress. But stress can show up differently in people's in people's eyes. And these are this is my, this is a genetic tendency for me. My mom and my dad. Both have these rings. They're a little different than mine, but they have the same rings. They have the same eye color. My daughter has the same rings, the same eye color. My brother has the same rings and same eye color. Um, you know, so we all have the, that tendency. We all have that tendency. And so iridology to me is really about learning about who you are genetically and then eating the food that you need to eat for your body, listening, listening to your body um, and doing what your body wants rather than what your head wants. You know, I was talking to my husband yesterday, he's blue eyed and he eats cheese and then he gets mucusy. If he eats ice cream, he gets mucusy instantly and he's coughing and hacking and doing all these things. Well, blue eyed people shouldn't have dairy. Okay. It's mucus forming. They shouldn't have mucus forming food. And so I was talking to him about it and he goes, well, you know, I like cheese. I'm like, yeah, but it's a toxin to you. It's not good for you. Oh yeah, but that's all right. If I get a little phlegmy after I eat it. No, that's your body talking to you. Your body's talking to you and it's telling you that it's not good. So if you listen to your body, then you won't have that problem. But that's a genetic tendency for him. Okay. It's not good. So got to listen. And that's really what iridology is about. It's about educating, educating people to, to listen, to learn about their, their body. And once they learn about their body, then they know, they know what to do. They know what to eat. They know how much to sleep. They know what exercises to do. They know uh, what not to do. Okay. And they know, they learn what helps them so that they can live a good life, 
you know, when I'm 80 years old, I want to still be hiking and doing all the things that I want to do. So, you know, I, I got to take care of myself. This is my, this is my digestive system here. This is my stomach and my intestines. And I was miserable. You know, I can be miserable again. If I go back and do the things that I used to do when I was having all those problems, guess what? I'm going to go right back and have all those problems again. So I'm constantly paying attention to my diet. I'm constantly, you know, working on my diet and working with my body. And uh, this ring here, this has to do with uh, blood pressure and cholesterol and all those kinds of things. And I, and I do, I have the genetic, pre genetic predisposition for it. My, both sides of my family, all kinds of cardio issues and uh, cholesterol and high blood pressure and all those kinds of things. So I'm always paying attention to my diet, my stress level and, you know, paying attention to those things because it is a tendency for me. So this is how, you know, when we look at the eyes, we can see these things. This is a brown eye. This is a true brown eye. So the, the top layer of the eye, this is called the anterior border layer. This is where we see the pigment. So what makes the eye the colors that it is, is pigment. It's melanin. It's the same pigment that makes you tan, that makes your skin tan. That's what shows up in the eyes. So a blue-eyed person has very little pigment, very little pigment in that, in that layer. Um, a, uh, a mixed eyed person has some and the brown eyed person has a lot. They have a lot of pigment. Okay. And so in a brown eyed person, we can't see the pretty yellows and the pretty oranges and all those things, but we can see a lot of other things and we can still uh, perform iridology analysis with brown eyed people because we still know what to look for. We can still see the rings, you know, we can still see the white rings, we can still see the digestive system and the shape of the pupil and circulatory rings, we can still see a lot of things. So we can still do that. Okay, legal wording, iridology does not diagnose, but instead analyzes or assesses predispositions and genetic inheritance. And, uh, you know, it's really important when we look at the eyes that we look at them with reverence, honor, and respect, because you know what we're doing? We're looking in somebody. We're looking at their soul. You know, the eyes are the windows to the soul is what they say. But it all is also, you know, when we're looking at the eyes, we're looking at a person's personality. We can see a lot about personality. We're looking at their emotions. You know, we're looking at their feelings. We're looking at their physical health, their emotional health. We can see a lot by looking at the eyes, the behaviors, okay? So, so you're looking deeper than just looking at their iris and looking at the color. You learn a lot in just a, a couple of minutes about a person's health, about who they are, their personality and everything. And so we really need to be careful and uh, really be reverent and respectful. And, uh, you know, we're very concerned about, you know, with the interests of all who come into contact with iridology very important. So I, you know, I teach a class on the history of iridology and um, I wanted to put that in here so that you could just kind of get a little feel. If you like research, you can go online and research the history of iridology, uh, but iridology has been in Australia, China, Egypt, Greece, India, Italy, Europe, okay, and America. And uh, it goes all the way back, believe it or not, to King Tut. And uh, in 1922, an archeologist named Howard Carter discovered silver plates while exploring King Tut's tomb. Uh, it's thought that the silver plates are some of the first lessons of iridology dating back thousands of years in Egypt, okay? And from there, it went to, um, it went to China, Europe, and then, of course, other other regions. So, you know, a lot of people hear about iridology just because they hear of Dr. Jensen, but that's not where, where iridology started. It started way, way back. You know, Dr. Jensen brought it here to the United States, which is amazing. And I'm, I'm so, I am so thankful for that. You know, I mean, it changed my life. You know, who knows where I'd be without iridology. And uh, so this is just a little bit of information here. So uh, Ignaz von Pesli, he was in Hungary and uh, he was a Hungarian physician known as the father of Western iridology. 
Some of you may have heard about the story of the owl, where this owl supposedly got stuck in a tree. And as a child, he, you know, he rescued the, the owl, mended the owl's leg, and a line formed in the bottom part of the owl's iris. Well, they're questioning the story now because nobody has been able to duplicate this, right, in a wild bird. So now they're wondering if it's really true or not. I don't know if it's true, um, but you know that's there's some, that's something that they're questioning. So that was in 1826, okay? And uh, he did publish a book, Discoveries in the Field of Natural Science and Medicine: A Guide to the Study and Diagnosis from the Eye. They use that word diagnosis then, but we cannot use it. I'm actually thinking about doing uh, giving another webinar next month. Um, you know, iridology, a form of, you know, uh, diagnosis of the eye, and just talk about that and how we can't use the word diagnosis when we're, when we're working with, with, uh, with iridology. So Ignaz von Pesley, he's the one who built up the first known accurate chart of iridology. And here's Dr. Jensen, who we all love and who most of us have heard of. So, uh, you know, he brought iridology to the U.S. in 1950. He was a chiropractor, and he wrote the big book. I have uh, Science and Practice of Iridology, Volume 1 and Volume 2. And um, he said, it's very interesting to note that although these men lived many miles apart and did not know each other, they wrote similar books at the same time, even writing word for word in many instances. So, you know, very, very interesting. But, you know, he was, you know, whenever I talk about him, I say he was wonderful. And, and I remember when I took his class and, and being around him, he would say that everything was wonderful. Everything was wonderful. This is wonderful. That's wonderful. And so, you know, I have very good, good memories of Dr. Jensen and, and, and his class. So, um, like I said earlier, before he passed, he asked his daughter-in-law to continue his studies. So she has and to continue his research. And uh, so that she created the NIRA, which is the, Na the National Iridology Research Association, which then became IPA, which is the International Iridology Practitioners, Practitioners Association. And this is some information about it. Here's a, here is a symposium that we had. That's me way back there in the back. Uh, we had a little symposium, which we were having a symposium every year until COVID. And that was in person. And now we've been online because of COVID. So hopefully the next one, let's all keep our fingers crossed. We're planning on a live symposium next February in San Diego. So let's see if it works out. Hopefully it will. And we'll all get to get together. And it's wonderful getting together with like-minded people. I mean, the energy, just, just being able to talk to people, you know, like-minded people about iridology is amazing. And I always learn something, you know, at these conferences and I meet people, I know their names, but I haven't met them. And so, um, you know, it's, it's great to get together for these conferences. So if you're interested in becoming a member of IPA, there is IPA's website. Uh, it's $65 to become a member. If you're gonna become a student, then it's the same fee, it's $65. Uh, in the classes, I always, you know, everybody needs to become a member of IPA. In order to take an IPA exam, uh, the IPA exam at the end of the course, you have to be a member of IPA to be able to take the exam. And, uh, you know, that supports IPA so that they, you know, everybody can continue their research and uh, we can pay Patty because Patty's a secretary. She's, she's the only one that gets paid. Everybody else is either an instructor or a volunteer. You know, there's members of the board and we all volunteer our time. So we all teach. And, uh, you know, we all give webinars and we all volunteer. The symposium is all volunteer. I was just a speaker for the symposium in February. That's all volunteer. We have a health, conf health summit coming up in um, September. That's all volunteer. Everything's volunteer. So it, uh, IPA was founded for the purpose of increasing and communicating knowledge concerning the art and science of iridology and to pro provide a forum for the exchange of information and research with the goal of promoting excellent international iridology standards. And to see iridology, iridology utilized as an assessment tool in all branches of medicine, which would be great, wouldn't it? Both alternative and allopathic. 
in all countries and made readily available to every man, woman, and child. So that, those are huge goals, right? That's huge. It's huge mission and vision. Uh, and um, yeah, that would be amazing. So you can go to this website to the iridologyassociation.org. And if you want to find an iridologist in your area, you can just click on the link and then you'll see all the different state, all the different countries where IPA has iridologists. You can click, if you're in the United States, you can click on the state and there'll be a list of uh, certified comprehensive iridologists. If you want an instructor like me, you can click on instructors. You can see who's involved in IPA. There's many, many, many of us that are, that are supporting IPA and doing research. There's lots of webinars. If you like webinars, you can watch webinars and uh, learn. You can go onto my website and watch webinars that I've recorded. You know, they're free. You're welcome to do that and learn and uh, kind of get a sense of what's going on. So here's some information on modern studies and research that I put together. Harry Wolf, Bill Caradona, uh, they bridged the European and American iridology and formed the NIRA. And for an in-depth look at the history of masters of iridology, you can read Ellen Tart Jensen's book called Through the Eyes of the Masters, A History of Iridology. You can order that on Amazon. It doesn't cost very much. Um, Ellen has a paper called IPA History and My IPA Vision. If you want it, let me know. Send me a message. Not here, but send me a message. Uh, either Facebook me or email me or text me, and I'll, I'm happy to send you that paper. So here's some links if you want to learn more. Dr. Ellen Tart Jensen's website, Bernard Jensen International. Denny Johnson teaches RAID. David Pesic, like I said, he has the International College of Iridology. He, he holds that in October, so it's, it's coming up. Tony Miller, she's in Australia. She teaches integrated iridology. Um, IPA Iridologist, that's the website. Jim Burgess teaches behavioral iridology, if you're interested in that. Emotional iridology courses. And Mercedes Colburn, she's here in California. Uh, she teaches canine, feline, and equine iridology through the I uh, International. And she's still teaching. Uh, she teaches, her classes are online, and then you go to her ranch and she's got horses and you know and dogs and cats and you, you practice and learn everything from her so she's still teaching okay so you know we uh, IPA doesn't teach animal iridology but it is available if if that's something that you're and I do have it on my website as, as well but those are Mercedes classes so so here's the updated iridology chart so if you have Dr. Jensen's chart then Ellen what she did is she upgraded the chart uh, she added color. So each one of the areas is color coded. So the stomach and the is the nutritive zone that's green and the intestines in the nutritive zone is yellow. The blood and the lymph, which is called the humeral zone, that's red. The musculature is pink. The bony structure is gray. Uh, the superficial lymph and blood is light blue. And then the skin and the orifices is dark blue. And so that makes it really nice when you, you know, you're looking at these areas to be able to figure out what's what. This is Dr. Jensen's brain flare chart here at the top. Okay, so this is for the right eye and that fits in right here from 11 to one. And here is the left side and that fits in here. And then she also has the abbreviations here because you know, there's so many things that we can't write on this chart. Uh, you know, I mean, pons and pituitary and pancreas and, all these different things. So here's all the abbreviations. So she she revised it and added color. She also added other things into the chart. Uh, yeah, here's the spine, here's the atlas, and here's the tailbone. And so everything can be found uh, in these charts. So let's look at a couple of markings here. How are we doing on time? Uh, let's look at a couple of these markings. So this is called the circulatory ring. And uh, the circulatory ring shows up outside the iris. It's usually kind of a blue color. You notice this one's kind of a bluish gray. It can be kind of purple. You can see it's, it's a little bit more blue on this side here, but it shows up on the sclera. Okay, so it's actually off of the iris. And it has to do with you know, cold hands and cold feet. It has to do with numbness uh, in the extremities, you know, people that have uh, tingling in their in their feet and their hands um, and problems with um, problems with the extremities. 
So when we see that, I see that on most people, almost everybody has a circulatory ring. And I think it has to do with, you know, most people are shallow breathers. So they're not getting the oxygen that they need. And uh, they're not taking deep breaths and getting the oxygen. Contraction furrows, once again, this is my eye and these are the contraction furrows. I've already talked about those. Uh, they do, so, sometimes they start and stop. Sometimes they go all the way around without stopping. Sometimes they're here in the nutritive zone. Sometimes they're out here at the skin. See this is mine, I have them. I have them all in, this is the ciliary zone. I have them all in the ciliary. And uh, this is where all the organs are. And then I also have them out here in the skin. I have them right out here at the skin, which explains why when I was stressed so badly, I was breaking out in hives because I was stressed to the max. You know, I was so stressed. And I'm really so thankful that I went to an iridologist and learned about alternative medicine because that's not how I was brought up. I wasn't brought up with alternative medicine. I was brought up with doctors and medicine. Now my kids, they've been brought up with alternative medicine. So they know when they don't feel well, they can come to me and I will look at their eyes and I'll muscle test them and I'll, I'll you know, do the scans. I just did a scan on my daughter with the Zyto uh, and I put it on the website. I did a demo and she, you know, she volunteered for the scan. So my kids have been brought up with alternative. So they know, you know, they can use herbs and vitamins and homeopathy and essential oils and chiropractic and, you know, all the different, um, all the different uh, tools out there they can use to improve their health and, and help them. Lacuna, here's a lacuna. It looks kind of like a hole. It looks like a hole in the iris. And this is an area that typically, usually does not absorb nutrients or release toxins as well as it should. Okay, so it's an area that needs nurturing. And depending on where that lands in the iris, that can tell, that's usually shows us a genetic tendency. So that can tell us, hey, this person may need to work on that area. Okay, that, that's an area that may need some work. Or we can see a lot as you see this brown pigment here. This is a very large brown pigment. Brown comes from the liver. Okay, so when we see brown, we usually think of the liver uh, and we may need to help the person detox. Okay, they may need to detox. They may need to change their diet. They may need to check for MTHFR and see if they're methylating. There's so many factors, so many factors, so many things that, you know, that we can see in the eye. And then we can then, when we see them, we can ask the questions, we can send people for tests. Uh, we can do scans, we can send people for, you know, for um, acupuncture or acupressure or massage or whatever, any of these different, um, you know, these, these different practitioners. When we see orange in the eye, that usually has to do with blood sugar, okay? So if we see orange here inside the nutritive zone, that usually means that maybe somebody might be low in enzymes, maybe low in hydrochloric acid, maybe having trouble breaking down fats and carbs. Okay, if there's orange outside this ring, then that usually can mean uh, they may have a tendency towards low blood sugar or high blood sugar. Can we say they have diabetes? No, we can't because we don't know. We can't say. We can send them for a blood test. We can have an A1C and a glucose checked, right? But we can't, we cannot diagnose them. Uh, this you can be, you know, this can be genetic. Maybe, and I, this is my father-in-law. Maybe his mom or his dad had diabetes or his grandma, his grandpa. And maybe he doesn't. Maybe his blood sugar is fine. Now, his, his wasn't. His blood sugar wasn't fine. Uh, but this is still a genetic tendency. This is still showing us that he could have that problem. So therefore, we say, okay, well, it's a genetic tendency. So let's start working on your diet, right? Let's avoid sugar. Let's not drink alcohol. Let's not do the things that are going to be harmful for you. And let's build. Let's work on nurturing your pancreas. What kinds of foods, what kind of diets, what kinds of cleanses, what kinds of herbs, what kinds of supplements would be helpful for that? Okay. So there's some, uh, just some ideas there. Lipemic diathesis. We used to call this a cholesterol ring, hardening the arteries. Some iridologists still call it a cholesterol ring. But this ring can be yellow, it can be brown, it can be uh, kind of orange, it can be white, it can be opaque where we can see through it. And just because somebody has this ring doesn't mean they have a problem. 
They may not. It could be genetic. Okay, maybe, like I said, maybe their mom or their dad or their grandparents or their great grandparents have this problem, and maybe they don't. And this is an older person, so this person did have a problem. But when we see this ring, this can have to do with cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL, LDL. It can have to do with high blood pressure, low blood pressure. It can have to do with blood sugar being out of balance. Okay, so many, many things. And just by looking at it, we can't say, oh, you have high cholesterol. We can't do that. Okay, we can't diagnose. We have to do the test to, to verify. Okay, they have a tendency towards it, but it doesn't mean that they have a problem. Okay, and also it's a corneal sign. It is not an iris sign. So it does not leave the iris. So if a person, let's say a person has, have, has a sign and they have high cholesterol and they change their diet and they bring their cholesterol down, they start exercising and maybe they do methylation or whatever. They take the herbs for cholesterol and, and, uh, and they go on, they do fasts and whatever they do. And they take a lot of EFAs and, and they get their cholesterol down to normal. That marking is not going to leave the eye. That is permanent. It's not going to leave the eye. Okay. If we see the sign in someone that's under 40, then we worry. We want to make sure that they're under supervision. Okay. Because um, it can be more serious. If somebody under 40 has this marking in their eye. And uh, it is also a sign that's noted for somebody that's aging. This is one of the signs that can get thicker. It can get thicker and darker as somebody ages. And these pigments can get larger. And um, they don't change color because they uh, pertain to that particular organ, but they can get larger and you can get more of them, more pigments as you age. Lipemic stands for fat and diathesis is genetic, a genetic predisposition to. Predisposition to. So lipemic diathesis stands for a predisposition to having high fat, okay, or high cholesterol. That's what that stands for. Pigments, lots of pigments. This is one of my clients that had uh, came to me with bladder problems, and uh, he's got all he has all kinds of pigments. He's got yellow. You can see yellow in there. You can see orange in there. You can see brown in there. You could even see black in there. Okay, you can even see black. And all these pigments have to do with the organs. So brown, liver, orange, pancreas, yellow kidneys, black has to do with usually something that's older that may not be causing problems. Okay, we have not, well, I can't say that, but I, I had a client once that um, I gave her some herbs and then her pigments left her eyes. We do see the pigments leave if they're caused by medications. There are certain medications that people take that can pigment the eyes. And then if, if the people, if, if the patient client stops taking the medication, the pigments will leave the eye. We have seen that. But normally they're cumulative. Normally people get more pigments as they age. And depending on the size of the pigment and the shape of the pigment and where the pigment is, that makes a difference. Okay, that makes a difference. So, um, these are pigments. Now, they're also called jewels, okay? So in red, pigments are called jewels, and it has to do with personality type. And um, so that's something that, that we go over in level three in great detail is pigments and um, how they're jewels and what it has to do with and, and so on. A scurf rim, here's a, here's a ring here. It's really pretty. And there's a lot of people that have a ring, a dark ring. You could actually, when you stand in front of somebody, a lot of times you'll see it. It looks like they just kind of outline their eye with um, eyeliner or, you know, uh, eyebrow pencil or something. They just outline their eye. But this is in zones six and seven. And this has to do with the skin. And when it goes in here, it also has to do with the, the lymph and the circulation. So... We used to think that if somebody skin brushed for a year, that this ring would go away. It doesn't. This is caused by a thinning of the iris fibers. And you can see the iris fibers coming in here and they get very thin. So the back layer of the eye is black. It's supposed to be black. That's the bottom. That's the very bottom layer. The, the iris is four layers. The top layer is where you see the pigment. So you see the yellow, right? You see the yellow in there and the white in there and the blue, okay? That's the top layer. That's the, the, the color. The very bottom layer 
is the back of the eye. Okay. And it comes, it comes around and it swoops around and it comes right here next to the pupil. So it comes across here and then it curves up and around the pupil. And this is what you're seeing here. You're seeing the very bottom layer of the eye. And that's because this, this pigment, this, these, these fibers are thin. So this does not go away, but this does show us that the person has a genetic tendency towards having skin problems. Maybe they have dry skin, or maybe they um, have uh, eczema or psoriasis or you know problems with their skin. Okay, uh, maybe their skin doesn't breathe. Maybe they wear a lot of synthetic clothing. Uh, maybe they have a lot of uric acid buildup on their skin. You know, there's lots of things, and uh, the skin is also your uh, emotional connection to the outside world. And so there's an emotional connection. Um, so, you know, we learn about those things in the classes as well, um, how that all fits together. TOFI, TOFI, we used to call this a lymphatic rosary because it looks like a rosary going around here, dot, 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 lots of dots. Um, all blue-eyed people have these, TOFI. Uh, all, um, most mixed-eyed people have them. And we're even seeing them in brown-eyed people. Uh, this is, has to do with the immune system, okay? And um, this is another marking that can get darker as we age. When it's white, it usually has to do with an overactive immune system. When it's more yellow, possibly could be toxic. You know, uh, as somebody cleanses, will it change? Not usually. Usually doesn't change. Usually these pigments do not go away. And uh, the only way we can prove that is to have before pictures and after pictures and study them, and really study them and look at all the markings and see, you know, if the same lighting was used, then we can compare the pictures and see, oh, yeah, so that TOFI has changed. It's gotten bigger, it's gotten smaller, it's, got, it's not here anymore, or it wasn't there before and now it's here. And, you know, what could that mean? You know, is there a problem there now? Is there not a problem? Is everything okay? Is there pain, inflammation? You know, this happens to be the lung and the breast reaction field here. So could there be lumps in the breast or could there have been pneumonia or problems with breathing? And, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things that it could be related to. So, okay, so we also look at pupils. These are large pupils here and large pupils. And uh, you could see, you know, you can imagine that when the pupil enlarges, it pushes all of these markings out, it flattens them. Okay, it flattens and flattens all the markings out there. Okay, and so then when we have the opposite and we have small pupils that pull in, you know, this lacuna here, if, if, if this pupil enlarges, then this lacuna is gonna get wider. But because these pupils are very small, very tiny, it pulls this lacuna and it makes it long. Okay, and so that's how the eye changes. But that's not a structural change. That's just because of the pupil opening and closing and opening and closing with light. So we look at the size of the pupils. We look at the shape of the pupils. There's a lot of things. And then this is sclerology here. I put four pictures in here. This is the nasal and temporal regions. And we look at everything in the sclera. We look at the colors. Yellow, um, we look for yellow and pink. We can see blue in there. We can see gray in there. Sometimes it can even be black. Uh, we look at the blood vessels, where they are, where they're going, uh, what shape are they, all those kinds of things. You know, do they make a hook? Do they make a complete, uh, do they make a complete uh, enclosed area? Uh, you know, do they just kind of meander? Do they spiral? Uh, do they make a fork? You know, there's all kinds of markings that show up in the sclera. Now, the sclera changes. Okay, the sclera changes. So as somebody improves, as this person improves their health, their sclera is going to get whiter. So the whiter your sclera is, it doesn't have the yellows and the pinks and the blues and the, you know, and all the colors, then the healthier basically you are. And so this is this this is why when we have people come back for iridology, we really look at that sclera and we look at these vessels to see if they're uh, thinner, you know, if they are thicker, uh, you know, where they're going, you know, where they're coming from and where they're going and what they're doing. And that tells us a lot about circulation in the body. It tells us, you know, what areas could be affected in the body and so on and what's improving. 
what needs to be nurtured, what's detoxing, and, and so on. Okay. And so that's what we that's what we look when we look at the sclera. So I want to thank you for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. And if you're interested in learning iridology, you're interested in learning all this new stuff. It's not really new, but um, I'm continuing to learn all the time. And as I learn, I bring all this new information and new, new studies into the class. My next live class starts in August, August 2nd, which is coming up really fast. And it runs through December, Tuesdays and Thursday mornings from 8 to 10 Pacific Standard Time. Everything's recorded. So I have, I have students that come into the Zooms. I have students uh, that do both. I have students that take, every, take the class on their own time. I have students do a little bit of both. They take it in person, they take it online. Right now I have a chiropractor in Washington. Uh, one day she has patients. So that day she watches the recordings. The other day she doesn't and she comes into class. And so, you know, we're real flexible here. You know, if you want to learn iridology and you want to learn with us, we're very flexible. We'll, we will work with you. We have payment plans. You can pay everything up front. You can do payment plans. Uh, IPA has a $200 fee for their exam, and that's separate, and that's at the very end uh, before you go into the exam. There's a registration link. I do teach level one, level two, and level three. I think we're going to be doing a level three in September for everybody that's already graduated from level one, level two. I do mentoring. I teach private classes. I'm willing to travel now that things are open again. I do one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Uh, there's my information, my email again, and phone numbers. And uh, you know, I'm open to to working with uh, with you if that's something you're interested in. Okay. So there you go. Any questions or comments? Any questions for me or anything that you would like to know? You can, let me see, I, let me make sure, hold on a second, let me make sure I set it so that you can. Um, go ahead, can you uh, go ahead and un unmute? Oh, you're already unmuted. Christine, you have a question? Yes. Uh, is it possible for a person's eye color to change? Well, like I said, I mean, what are you talking about? From brown to blue or from blue to mixed? I, don't, I uh, recently I've had people even ask if I wear contacts. My eyes, I thought were brown. Now my dad had blue, green, gray eyes, mm. and and it's not just me. All my siblings, their eyes are changing too, to where they 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 don't look brown anymore. They're different colors, and I I just I just had an eye exam. I don't have anything that <laughs> causes you know. So I was that's I'm kind of curious about that. Well, usually, like I said, usually the eyes. You are more accumulative. They'll usually get darker as you age. However, it really depends. Maybe you have a mixed eye. If you have a mixed eye and you're not a true brown eyed person, they're going to change. It changes based on your emotions. It changes based on your inflammation level, uh, the amount of fluid that you have in, in your eyeball, the aqueous, uh, the aqueous humor. There's a lot of things that can change the way your eye looks, your emotions, how you feel, you know, um, if you get take pictures, take pictures uh, of the eye, and then we can tell, we can figure out if you're a true hematogenic, if you're really a brown eyed person, or if you're not, you know? Okay. Yeah. And um, there's a lot of things that can make it look like it changes. It depends on the lighting. There's lots of things. But you may not be a true brown eyed person. You may be a mixed. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Let's see, Dr. Awilda says, thank you, great presentation. You are a great instructor. My daughter-in-law, Jenna Wilson has, let's see, let me, I can't read the rest of that, let me see. Has been traveling from California to Georgia and got the time zones mixed up. She'd like a link to the recording. Yeah, I will, I'll send it out. I'm gonna send a recording out for everybody 
So um, no problem. There's a lot of people actually, there were 43 people that signed up for this tonight. So, you know, and people are all different time zones. Same with our, our students, they're all in all different time zones. So uh, the time doesn't always work out. So I always record. Anything else? Any other questions, comments? Oh, Dr. Anna, it's nice to see you. I talked to you the other night. Yes, yes, right. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you. Welcome. Anything else? No? Okay, I will stop the recording.